Well, good morning. If you have your Bible, I hope you do. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 20 this morning. We're in Genesis chapter 20. We have been spending our summer going through the biography of the great patriarch Abraham. And uh, I've always liked reading biographies. When I was a little kid, I, I remember I used to go to the library and I used to check out biographies. They were my book of choice. But back then, most of the biographies that I read, at least the kids' biographies, were not what I would call true biographies. They were more hero stories. Like I would check out the biography of Teddy Roosevelt and it would tell me about how he beat asthma when he was a kid and how he was a rough rider and how he cared about the wilderness. But you never heard anything about Teddy Roosevelt other than what a great guy he was, right? I read a biography a couple years ago of Ronald Reagan written by one of his former speechwriters, Peggy Noonan. And it was a wonderful biography, but it didn't say anything bad about President Reagan. It was just what a great president he was, what a great person he was. Really more of a hero story. In fact, it was titled, When Character Was King. So it's kind of like, you know, this is who Ronald Reagan is. And it is not unusual for us to want to turn our leaders into heroes, to want to mythologize, to want to create a larger-than-life, more perfect persona than really exists. We often prefer the mythology to the reality. But the Bible has a very different approach when it comes to the great men of the Bible. The biographies we have in the Bible are real biographies. They tell the real stories. They tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. They are candid and honest accounts of the great moments and the not so great moments in the lives of men and women of faith shows that they are they're flawed. In fact, uh, A.W. Pink says, the common custom of biographers is to conceal the defects and blemishes in the, character, in the careers of the characters which they delineate. And this, has it been, had it been followed, would naturally forbid the mention of uh, the, the chapter we're going to read, such a fall in the life of the most venerated names in all of the scrolls of history. But herein is where the Bible differs from other books, Pink says. He says, the Holy Spirit has painted the portraits of scriptural characters in the colors of nature and truth. He has given a faithful picture of the human heart, such as is common to all mankind. You read the biography of Abraham, you read the biography of any of the great characters of the Bible, you see the warts, you see the flaws, which, by the way, means when you get to the story of Jesus, and you don't see the flaws, it's not because the writers are now covering something up. That's not their style. It's that the flaws aren't there. It's that you can read about David, you can read about Moses, you can read about Abraham, and you see greatness with flaws. You read about Jesus, and it's a different picture. The study of Abraham really has three recurring motifs throughout this, three, uh, three patterns that continue to emerge. There is the motif of the great faith of Abraham, and we see that. He, he, the, he, he leaves Ur, he leaves comfort, he leaves family, he leaves possessions, he goes a thousand miles, he's not sure where he's going. This is a great move of faith on Abraham's part. He's following the God who has appeared to him and said, follow me, and he obeys. It is a great moment of faith. When his nephew Lot comes to him and the herds are too big and the, the flocks are too big, Abraham demonstrates faith by putting the, the peace of the relationship, the priority of the relationship over his own expanse or comfort, and he says, you pick, you go. I want this to be about, uh, about peace among us and not about empire building. That's a moment of faith in Abraham's life. When Lot is captured and taken hostage by the, the, the Chaldeans who come and, and have the raiding party, Abraham puts together a raiding party of his own, a, a small battalion, and they go against the armies to rescue Lot. It's an act of faith on Abraham's part. When God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to mark yourself and mark all the men in your family and in your community with the mark of circumcision, Abraham displays great faith in obeying God and saying, we will do this in spite of the pain. And when Lot is in trouble again in Sodom, Abraham displays faith by interceding, going to God and saying, God, if there are 50 righteous, will you spare it? He's, he's begging for the life of his nephew in the midst of God's judgment. So here are some of the, the hero moments in the life of Abraham, things that mark him as a great leader, a great man of faith. And if somebody had been writing 
the story of Abraham today, they might have just made those all we talked about. They'd have left out the warts. But the Bible has a second motif. There's the, the great moments of faith in Abraham's life, and then there's the flawed faith in Abraham's life, which keeps showing up as well. It includes chapter 12, where he lies about his wife being his sister while they're in Egypt because he fears his own safety. So he makes up that story, lies about being married to Sarah, saying, she's my sister. Uh, and, and we see the picture again with the whole episode with Hagar. Uh, we, we see Abraham's flawed faith in that moment. We're going to see it this morning when he lies again about being married to Sarah. And, uh, and, and so that there's the examples of flawed character. And so you've got the motif of great faith, you've got the motif of flawed faith, and the third motif, or the third pattern that's all through the life of Abraham, is the faithfulness of God and the promises of God repeatedly being made to Abraham when he is demonstrating great faith, God comes and says, I have blessing for you, I have promise for you. When he is flawed in his faith, God comes and says, I still have my promises for you. I still have blessing for you. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 18, God says, here's my promise, here's my promise, here's my promise, over and over again. And he's making it clear that his promises to Abraham are kept in spite of Abraham's flaws. In spite of the fact that Abraham messes up, God will remain faithful. And it's not because God looks at Abraham's life and says, well, you know, the good outweighs the bad. That's not why God's keeping his promises to Abraham. It's because, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the promises of God are yes and so be it. When God makes a promise, he's going to keep his word. Our failures, and we have them, do not nullify the promises of God in our life. So I want us this morning to read through Genesis 20. We're going to do that in just a minute. But I want you to think for just a minute about your own life. If somebody was going to write your biography, if somebody was going to write your story, if you were going to write your story, what would be, not, not your hero story, not your padded resume story, that's the one we'd all like to write, but if somebody was writing the real story, the warts and all story, there, there would be moments of high faith. Moments when you demonstrated great faith in God, wouldn't there be? In fact, can you think about, just think in your own life. This might be a discussion question over lunch today or later this week. If you were to think in your, your life, could you come up with two or three moments that you would say these were moments where, by God's grace, I demonstrated faith, where I, it didn't seem logical, it didn't seem to make sense, but we said this is what we believe God wants us to do, and we stood out. Could you come up with those moments in your own life? If you're taking notes, you might just jot down what would those moments be and share them with somebody. Now, there would also be moments when you demonstrated flawed faith, right? In fact, those may come to mind more readily than the moments of great faith. But there have been valleys or low points in your own life, right? And if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I really cannot come up with any of those. Just ask somebody in your family. <laughs> they, they probably know exactly where to point you. But here's the good, mood, the good news. You and Abraham and Moses and David and Noah and Jacob and Peter and everybody else in the Bible have some things in common. Moments of great faith, moments of flawed faith. And God has this in common, or not in common, but has this universally throughout that. He demonstrates faithfulness to you and to them in spite of the flawed faith. There, there's a verse in the song, Jesus Loves Me, that uh, you, you may not have sung this verse growing up. It was not in the original. It was added later on. Lots of people have added verses to Jesus Loves Me, but there was a verse that says, Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, though it makes him very sad. Abraham's life is a testimony to the fact that God keeps his promises. God loves his child, Abraham, his friend, Abraham, when he's good, when he's bad. And it's not contingent on his goodness, and it's not revoked with his badness. It's the faithfulness of God all the way through. So, that's just kind of the hors d'oeuvre to what I want us to talk about this morning. It's not the main course, but let's dive in. I want us to read Genesis 20, and uh, before we do that, let's ask God to give us the gift of illumination that we will 
uh, see and hear what he would say to us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would prepare our hearts even now, that we would accept your word. Silence in us, we ask, any voice but your own, that in hearing we might also obey you through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. This is the Word of God for the people of God. This is Genesis chapter 20. Read along as I read aloud. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, She's my sister? And she herself said, He's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I've done this. Then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. When Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, or then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you've brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You've done to me things that ought not be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? Abraham said, I, I did this because I thought there's no fear of God in this place, and they'll kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. She became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do to me at every place which we come. Say of me, He is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It's a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you, and before everyone you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Does that story sound familiar to any of you? Back in Genesis chapter 12, we saw a very similar account. The location's different. This time we are in Gerar. Before we were in Egypt, back in Genesis chapter 12. This time it's a, it's a Philistine king, not an Egyptian pharaoh that we're talking about. By the way, Gerar is in, in southern Israel today. It's about eight miles outside of Gaza, if you've been in the news. That's where the land of Gerar is, north of the Negev, but uh, in, in the south of Israel. Genesis 12, again it was Pharaoh who wanted Sarah, this time it's a king named Abimelech, and with Pharaoh, God intervened in the situation by bringing a plague on Pharaoh's household. Same kind of thing happens here with the barrenness of the women, but God comes in a dream. This is one of the differences in this story. Verses seven, 3 through 7 give us the details of the dream where Abimelech is told what's really going on. But most of this account just reads like a photocopy of Genesis chapter 12. In fact, some liberal scholars look at this story and they say, well, this is just a different writer telling a different... They, they got the details wrong. It's just the same story. It only happened once. Well, have you ever had a sin pattern in your life that didn't just happen once? Ever had anything that you did one time and 20 years later you did the same thing? 
I mean, why would we think that Abraham would only do it once? Warren Wiersbe says about, about this passage as well as Genesis 12, he said, Abraham had stopped asking what is right and had begun to ask what is safe. And this is what led to his downfall. Abraham had this ongoing pattern in his life where his fear of what might happen to him had begun to take, had begun to sideline his faith. When the king comes and confronts Abraham with what he's done in verses 9 and 10, Abraham gives the same lame rationalization he gave down in Egypt. He said, well, I did it because I thought you're going to kill me and take my wife. And besides, she is indeed my sister. I got the loophole. I got the technicality. He pleads his innocence based on that. And then in verses 14 to 16, Abimelech gives Sarah back to Abraham. And look, at he gives him livestock and money, a thousand pieces of silver. The most in that day that you would pay for a bride was 50 pieces of silver. That was the maximum bridal price. He gives 20 times that to Abraham and gives the woman back. And you might go, why is he doing this when this guy just put his whole kingdom in danger? And the answer is, he recognizes this guy must be pretty important to God, the God who appeared to me in the dream. I'm going to treat this guy well, because hopefully if I treat him well, God won't punish me. And the account ends with Abraham praying for God to show mercy and grace to Abimelech, God responding by making it possible for Abimelech's people to be able to conceive and give birth to children again. And had that not happened, what we would understand from this passage is that the people, the Philistines, Abimelech's people would have been wiped out because nobody would have born a kid. Then the end of the line for Abimelech. Now, I think there are two big questions that come out of this passage for us. The first question is, who's acting like the Christian here? I mean, when you read through this, don't you read through this and go, what? You're telling me the Philistine pagan king is acting with integrity and character, and Abraham's a schmuck, right? So that's the first question. Who's the Christian here? Is it the fearful prophet or the king with the conscience? Second question here is, how could Abraham fall into the same trap here 25 years later? Didn't he learn anything the first time? So those are the two questions we're going to wrestle with as the main course for this morning. Uh, the first question, look back at, at uh, Genesis 20, ask the question between Abraham and Abimelech, who's showing the more godly character here? Who's the one with integrity? Who's the one acting in a noble way? It's not Abraham, right? Well, here's what you need to know. If friendship with God was based on who acts most righteously and honorably, which person in Genesis 20 would be the friend of God? Abimelech. But who is the friend of God in Genesis 20? In spite of how he acts? Abraham. Why? Because friendship with God is not based on the frequency of or intensity of our failures. In other words, you don't forfeit your relationship with God through your failures. You don't earn your relationship with God through your good behavior. Friendship with God had been established by God with Abraham by His sovereign design, and it was not based on Abraham's moral virtue. And the fact that Abimelech is not a friend of God is not based on the fact that he's acting with integrity here. In other words, he can't earn his way into friendship with God by having good character. Does, does Abimelech have faith in God in this passage? No, here's what he has. He has a fear of God. He does fear what this God who has appeared to him in this dream might do, and he responds to the fear of God by going to Abraham and saying, why'd you do this And here? I want to make this thing right. But listen, there is a difference between fearing God's judgment and being God's friend between fearing the judgment of God and being welcomed into the household of God as a part of his family and as his child. We often hear a testimony that, where people will share, when I was young, I prayed a prayer because I didn't want to go to hell. Okay? In other words, I prayed a prayer because I feared God. I want to suggest to you this morning that if all your relationship with God is, is I don't want to go to hell, so I'll believe in whatever you say, that's not the basis for a relationship with God. 
That's not a sufficient relationship with God. I'll love Jesus. You just keep me out of hell. You don't love Jesus. You just don't want to go to hell. Right? If, if you think that God is your divine insurance agent and don't see him as your father and your friend, you don't have a love relationship with him, you don't have that relationship being the centerpiece of your life, if, he, if, if you see him as your defense attorney on the judgment day and not as your kinsman redeemer, the one to whom you're related, the one with whom you share life, then I want to suggest to you that you have not understood what is at the heart of the good news of the gospel, and, and that is what ultimately brings you from death to life. Abimelech had a fear of God, but he was not a child of God or a friend of God. And that is why even in this setting, where Abraham's being a coward, where Abraham's being a hypocrite, when, when he's scheming and lying, God still honors his promises to Abraham and gives him grace because Abraham is a friend of God. Warren Wiersbe says it this way. He says, in spite of his disobedience, Abraham was accepted before God, but Abimelech was rejected and under divine condemnation. God would chasten Abraham, but he would condemn Abimelech. And James Montgomery Boyce adds, God was not indifferent to Abraham's sin. He would deal with it. But that sin did not change God's view of Abraham. Abraham was still God's man. He was still a prophet. He was still a friend of God. In fact, in spite of the fact that Abimelech displayed more noble character in this matter, God tells him in verse 7, unless you go to Abraham the prophet, the friend of God, and have him pray for you, you're a dead man. That's got to be humbling. You're the guy acting with character, with nobility. This guy's the coward and, and the, the hypocrite. And God says to you, this guy better pray for you or you don't have any hope. Really? So the question of who's the Christian here, the fearful liar or the king with the character, has to be answered on the basis not of who's acting with nobility and integrity. It has to be answered on the basis of who's trusting God in this. Now, maybe Abraham's not trusting God at the moment. He's not, right? But who has a pattern of trusting God in his life and is displaying flawed faith here? Abimelech has no pattern of trusting God. This may be the first time he's even been aware of the God. In fact, he's been worshiping other gods. So the God of Israel comes to him. He doesn't have a relationship. He has a fear, but he doesn't have trust in this God. He just wants out of his jam. Which brings each of us, I think, to a point where we have to re-examine what's at the center of our relationship with God. Is it a fear that we don't want God's judgment in the end or a hope that God will somehow get us out of jams in this life? We're happy, as some people have described, to have him as our spare tire as, as that, uh, that uh, tire in the, in the back that if you, if you get into trouble, you can put it on and keep going? That, that you've trusted Jesus because you don't want to go to hell, but there's no active, ongoing love relationship. You see, the person who has an active, ongoing love relationship with God and who stumbles his way through it is a child of God. The person who's got uh, a fear of hell and wants to keep God in a compartment, th that person is no friend of God not a child of God. Do, does it bother you that there will be people in hell who showed more kindness and compassion in this life than Christians? Does it bother you that there will be people in hell who are more scrupulously honest and self-sacrificing than some Christians? If that bothers you, it's because you are still thinking with a self-righteousness mindset about what brings you to heaven or hell. You're still thinking that righteousness is the basis, your righteousness is the basis on which people face eternity either with hope or with dread. Instead of thinking about the fact that there may be people with more integrity who wind up in hell, we ought to be asking the question, what about our own character? and the holes in it, and the flaws in it, and does that trouble us? There are people who don't know God who sometimes act more Christ-like than you do, right? But you need to remember that if you are a friend of God, a child of God, accepted into his family, you didn't get there because you acted better than somebody else. 
You don't remain a child of God because you perform better than somebody else. You remain a child of God and He loves you because you trust Him. Not perfectly. There's flawed faith. And when you mess up, you fess up. That's what Christians do. We mess up and then we confess it and we repent and God helps us get better. God is not your insurance agent. He's not your defense attorney. He's not just those things. He is your father, your child. He loves you. If you're related to him, that's the relationship you have with him. So I want, I want everybody here just this morning to stop and say, is that the relationship I have with God? Is it a relationship of love? Is it a relationship where I'm grafted in? Is it a relationship where I'm a part of the family, where, where it def- redefines my life, it redefines everything about who I am and what I do? Or is it the spare tire relationship? Is it the get me out of a jam relationship? Is it a make sure I stay out of hell relationship? Second question. How could Abraham fall into the same trap? Didn't he learn anything? from what happened in Egypt almost 25 years ago. Let me ask you this. When you read Genesis 20, when you first read through it for the first time and you saw this, did you respond with this idea of, how could this guy do this again? Or did you respond with a sense of recognition, kind of like, well, he messed up, he messes up over and over again, just like I mess up over and over again. And, and I guess God gives grace, and so I don't need to sweat that stuff. You see, I think there are, two, there are two impulses we have when we read a passage like this, and both impulses are right, and both impulses are dangerous if you carry them too far. It is a right impulse to look at this and go, no, he should not have acted this way. That's the righteous impulse, and it's a good impulse to say, Abraham should have known better, Abraham should have acted better, it is right for you to have that impulse. Here's the danger of that impulse. The danger is it can too quickly become self-righteousness or judgmentalism or legalism or arrogance or a proud spirit when you say, how could Abraham do that? I would never do that. Right? Here's how, here's how I am wired and I suspect you are wired the same way. I'm wired. If I see somebody fall into a sin that is a sin where I'm not tempted in the same area that they're tempted in, okay? You know, they're, they're, we, have, we have different things that tempt us differently. Like it might be that, that you're tempted for gossip and I'm tempted for gluttony, okay? We'll just use those as hypotheticals, all right? Don't laugh. I said they're <laughs> it's hypotheticals, Okay. So you're tempted by this, and I'm tempted by that. So I see somebody gossiping, and I'm wired to go, why do they do that? That's that's so terrible, you see, because I have, I'm not tempted that way. So I have this good feeling about myself that that's, but, and then maybe I'll see somebody who is more gluttonous than I am, and I'll go, oh, that's sad, you know? Right, because so I can have this self righteousness uh, thing with the, with the overly gluttonous person, where I go, yeah, boy, I'm I'm not like that. I'm not bad like that. And then when I see somebody who is maybe less gluttonous than I am, then then I go, well, he's he's just self righteous. <laughs> see, are you wired like that? Rarely do I see someone else sin, and do I find myself thinking, you know, that could be me, just as easily as it happened to them especially if it's not an area I'm tempted in. Somebody falls to some temptation I'm not tempted in, rarely do I think, you know, that could have been me. Rarely. You remember the Pharisee and the publican, Luke chapter 18? Pharisee comes out, what, what's he pray? He sees the publican over here, he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like that sinner. I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this. It's how I'm wired. The publican, what's he pray? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the response of a child of God who recognizes the reality of his sin. If you read this account of Abraham's life, this second failure, and you think, how did this guy let that happen? Then welcome to the club of Pharisees and self-righteous, okay? By the way, it's a big club. But there is another impulse that you can have when you read Genesis 12. It's the impulse of grace. A good impulse that, listen to me, can go too far. Now, some people would hear me say that, and they would go, no, grace can never go too far. How can you say grace can go too far? What do you mean by that? Well, 
there, there's a growing number of voices in the church today, men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ, people I, I love and people I respect, who I think are pushing the grace envelope. They would hear me say that, and they would go, no, you can't push the grace envelope too far. That's the point of the gospel. Grace is explosive. You, it's extravagant. It's boundless. It's wild. It's free. We just need to recognize we're going to mess up over and over again, and God's going to give us grace when we do, and that's going to be our existence, and don't worry about it. Just receive His grace. Just rest in His grace. Some of you may have read a book that came out years ago by a Catholic uh, um, I don't know, I don't think it was, a, I think it was a priest at one time. Brennan Manning wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel that came out a few years ago. And, and here's what he said. He said, for example, in his book, there's no need for law. A child doesn't have to be told to love his father. Okay? He said it's all about a grace-loving relationship. There's no need for law. Okay, I hear that, but listen. What do you do with Jesus saying, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Well, would Brennan Manning say, no, Jesus, there's no room for commandments, for law. It's just about love. Here's another example. A pastor who I respect, speaking to, an audi to audience members a number of years ago, and he said, if I knew Jesus was coming back next week, I'd go out and get drunk, because I've never been drunk. Now, I think this man was using hyperbole to make the point, the same point that Martin Luther was making when he wrote to his friend Philip Melanchthon, and he said this, he said, be a sinner and let your sins be strong, or sin boldly, but let your trust in Christ be stronger and rejoice in Christ who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. You, you see how the grace envelope can be pushed to a point where we presume upon the grace of God and we begin to take no responsibility for our own growth in grace and in righteousness, which is what God is doing, wants to do in our lives. And I think the problem with reading Genesis 20 and thinking this is all about the goodness of it's God's grace to Abraham. See, Abraham messes up. Abimelech's acting better than Abraham, but God just pours out his grace on Abraham. It's just another example that God is full of grace, and you don't even, you just, you go through life loving God and don't worry about where you mess up. God's just going to pour out grace on that. that. That position, in theological terms, is often referred to as anti nomianism. Anti against nomos means law. So it's being against the law or against rules, opposed to, to the law. But what the antinomian tends to do is to dismiss or minimize the reality of sin, his sin or the sin of others. He presumes upon the grace of God. He willingly, knowingly, without shame or remorse, indulges in his sin, knowing that God has promised grace so he can get by with it. I can get drunk on Saturday night, go to church on Sunday, and there's no issue because God forgives me. He knows I'm going to mess up, and he, he pours out grace. And that person who is pushing the grace envelope farther than he ought, I believe, really needs to look at his own heart and ask the question, do I hate sin the way God hates sin? Paul said, there are things I hate I end up doing. That's my testimony as well. But Paul started with, there are things I hate. I'm concerned that the grace folks today are saying, there are things I do and I know they're bad. I'm grateful for God's grace. You go, well, wait, wait, wait. Do you hate your sin? I remember an interview I did a number of years ago. This was before we lived in Little Rock. John MacArthur's book, The Gospel According to Jesus, had just come out. And there were other books that were coming out that were countering his, what he was saying in the book. So I thought, on my radio talk show, I'm going to do an hour-long interview with John MacArthur about his book. Then I'll do an hour-long interview with the other guys about their book. And we'll, you know, we'll just have a good talk show thing going on. So I... I'm doing this interview with John MacArthur, and I said, okay, Philippian jailer asks the question, what must I do to be saved? So that's, that's the question. And I'll never forget John MacArthur, really. He said, you know, there are three questions that I have as kind of diagnostic questions with somebody who says he's a Christian. The first question is, do you love God? So as a person who says I'm a Christian and doesn't say I love God, we have a fundamental disconnect there, right? right. Are you married? Yes. Do you love your wife? No. Well, we got a fundamental disconnect. Something's wrong in that relationship. So I'm a Christian. Do you love God? That, that ought to be a part. Second question I ask is, do you hate sin? 
Because a person who says, I love God, but I don't hate sin. Yeah, we've got a fundamental disconnect there. Now, do I hate sin perfectly? No, neither do you. Are there things I hate I end up doing? Yes, we're all in that boat. But when I'm confronted with sin, does my heart break? Is, is there sadness over the reality of sin in my life? Do I long for the day when sin is gone? <laughs> when in, in me and in the world and, and redemption occurs? Do you love God and you hate sin? Here's the third question he said. Are you willing to follow Jesus? Are you willing to follow God's, God's word says this? Are you ready to follow it? Again, not perfectly, but is that the inclination of your heart? You love God, you hate sin, you're willing to follow Jesus. Three pretty good diagnostic questions to ask somebody who says, I'm a Christian. So in this passage, I think we see that even people with great faith can be plagued by not just a, a lapse. I, in fact, I think God has this passage in here to show us this is not just a lapse that Abraham does once and gets out of. This would be a, a besetting sin pattern in Abraham's life. I looked up the word besetting, because that's not a word we use very often, right? I bet you haven't said besetting all week, right? So what does it mean to beset? Well, according to the dictionary, to beset means to trouble or threaten persistently. To beset is to trouble or threaten persistently. Some of us have sin patterns in our lives, flesh patterns, habitual sin patterns that threaten or trouble us persistently. It would appear from Genesis 12 and Genesis 20 that Abraham had a besetting sin problem, something that reoccurred in his life over time, and it was this sin pattern that when I am facing potential harm, I freeze up and I will lie. That's a besetting sin pattern. One of the sermons I'm going to come back and do when we're done with Genesis at some point is how do we deal with besetting sins in our lives? We don't have time to do it this morning, but... All of us are predisposed in certain directions with certain sin patterns. All of us have certain things that we're more likely to sin in, areas we're more likely to sin in than somebody else is. What do you do with those? How do you handle that? And for those of you who don't want to wait for the sermon series, I'll just recommend two books to you that will help you with that. One book is called The Enemy Within, written by a guy named Chris Lungard. Interestingly enough, Chris wrote the manuscript for that book in Little Rock, he wrote it in the library of what is now Access Academy over on Breckenridge, what used to be the Bible Church, back when, when uh, I think it was back in the 80s, or the, yeah, I think it was back in the 80s, that he went through John Owen's book on the mortification of sin. He updated it for mo with modern language. He wrote this book called The Enemy Within, and it's a great book on putting sin to death, mortification of sin. How do you strangle a life out of sin? That's what it's about. Second book is a book called License to Kill, a field manual for mortifying sin by a guy named Brian Hedges. It's a quick, easy-to-read book, very helpful, very practical. In fact, let me just read this quote. Brian Hedges says, We claim to believe that sin is an awful thing. After all, we're good Christians, aren't we? Yet we conveniently assume that in our special case, our transgressions are really nothing more than minor offenses against an overly rigid rule, like, you know, driving five miles an hour over the speed limit. We treat sins like annoying warts, unpleasant perhaps, but not really threatening to a robust spiritual life. Jesus, in contrast, considers them cancerous. See, we don't have the same view of sin that Jesus has. The truth is, all of us have these flesh patterns, these sin patterns. Hebrews 12 refers to these as sins that cling closely or sins that can easily ensnare or entangle you. You may not be tempted in one direction, but there's something else where you're tempted. So, and, and I'm guessing, again, that you could probably name a besetting sin area in your life. It's something you come back to again and again. And I don't know if it's anger for you or greed or laziness or envy. You can read through Galatians 5, verses 19 through 22. There's a good list there. You can say, which one of these sounds like me? probably your besetting sin area and if you have trouble identifying your besetting sin again turn to your family they'll be help, uh, happy to help you with what is your besetting sin and, and I said we'd, we're not going to have time to deal with this today but I do want to give you um, again this is from John MacArthur he lists eight ways to deal with sin patterns in your life and I think it, some of you instead of writing this down I will put in the newsletter all eight of these this week 
so that you don't have to try to scramble furiously to write this down. He says the first thing you got to do is don't underestimate the seriousness of sin. He says, I think the major reason we don't deal with sin strongly and firmly is because we underestimate how serious it is. MacArthur says to God, to us, to those with whom we fellowship, to the church, we need to understand sin is serious. That's number one. Number two, we need to strongly purpose and promise to God not to sin. He says we need to take a solemn vow and say, God, I don't want to sin. I don't want to break your law. I don't want to grieve your spirit. I don't want to dishonor the name of your son, which I bear. The psalmist in Psalm 19.106 says, I have sworn and I will confirm that I will keep your righteous ordinances. When there is a particular sin area in your life, take a vow. Go to God and say, God, I, I promise. Now, you, you don't want to say it, right? It is wicked. It is deceitful. Satan is wicked. He is deceitful. Understand that except for the grace of God, you would fall into any and every sin that could so easily entangle you. Number four, resist the first uprisings of the flesh and its pleasures. Don't wait until you've, you've dabbled a little bit. Cut it off at the beginning. Number five, meditate on God's Word. Psalm 37, 31 says, The law of God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. You put God's Word in your heart. It is living. It's active. It's a tool. It's a, it's a sword in the fight against sin. Number six, be immediately repentant when you, when you have lapses. When you sin, confess immediately, name the sin, say it out loud what it was that you just did, confess that you don't want to do it again. MacArthur says, let your own heart and even your own ears hear the naming of that sin so that you develop in your heart a high degree of accountability with God, having named the very sin for which he's holding you accountable not to commit again. Number seven, continually pray for divine help. God wants to help you. Ask him for help. Ask him to protect you. Jesus' disciples said, Ephesians 6, 18, after listing all of the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, the sword of the Spirit battle, you know this, it says, uh, after all of this water, he says, pray always with all prayer and all supplication. You don't just be armored up, but you've got to pray. And then number eight, he says, establish relationships with other believers who can hold you accountable. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6. Fulfill the law of Christ. By the way, this is one of the reasons why, as we start up small groups again this, this fall, it's one of the reasons why we ought to be in small group with one another. Because we ought to be bearing one another's burdens. We ought to be sharing the challenges we're going through with one another. We need that. It, small group's not where you sit around, make small talk, and then... And then talk just about a little bit about all the good stuff in your life and make sure nobody knows the real stuff you're wrestling with. Here's the, here's the reality. You got more resources at your disposal in the battle against sin than Abraham did. You realize that? We look at Abraham, just how could he do this again? He didn't have God's word to go back to his tent at night and pull out his Bible and read it and meditate on it. Didn't have that. You do. He didn't have a small group he'd get together with every Wednesday night and, and they'd say, how, how are you doing? You know, and are, are we... no, he didn't have that. You do. So maybe we ought to cut Abraham a little slack or maybe we just ought to acknowledge that the reality is we're too casual with our own sins. Maybe we need to take the job of mortifying sin a little more seriously. And maybe this morning as we come to receive the elements for communion, which is a part of our worship every week here at Redeemer, maybe we ought to recognize that this table is a, is a representation of God's grace, and we don't presume upon God's grace, but the bread and the cup that you will take, these are symbols of what it costs God to extend grace to you. A broken body, shed blood. He did not treat your sin casually or trivially. At great cost, he brought redemption. And maybe as we prepare our hearts, we ought to just ask, Lord, what is the sin pattern? Maybe you're aware of it. Maybe you've been thinking about it all morning this morning. The sin pattern in my life, Lord, help me. I want to turn up the gain in my battle against the flesh this week. I don't want to dishonor you. I don't want to take your grace for granted any longer. And as you come and receive the bread and the juice, these are elements designed to strengthen you. These are means of grace from God to strengthen you in the battle because you are taking into yourself a, a reminder of the price that Christ paid. You're coming and receiving tokens of a broken body and shed blood. Jesus
body was broken, his blood was shed because of your sin problem. And that's what we're reminding ourselves. The cup and the bread are means of grace. God conferring grace as you come believingly forward to receive and drink the elements. We, we practice what's called open communion here at Redeemer, which means that if you're here and you love Christ, Christ is at the center of, of your life. He is, he is your reason for existence. You know you're in the family of God. You know that God is your father. He's not just your insurance agent, not just your, your um, uh, advocate, but he is your father. Then you're welcome at the table. He has laid out this meal for his children. If you're here this morning and that's not the relationship you have with Christ, then rather than coming and receiving bread and cup, I would really encourage you to stop and consider what is it that God calls us to in Scripture? Ask the question, do I need a different relationship or do I need a new relationship? Do I need to know Christ in a way that I've never known Him before? And if that's true, then talk to me. Talk to one of the elders here. Talk to the person who brought you to church this morning. Talk to a friend and just say, I, I don't know Christ the way I ought to know Christ. So take a minute, prepare your heart, and then we will come and receive these elements. We come down the outer aisles, we take the bread and the cup, go back through the center aisle, back to your seats, and we'll receive the elements together here in just a minute.
Bible invites us to taste and see that the Lord is good, and Jesus, on the night before his crucifixion, having a meal with his disciples, took bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it. He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you receive this, remember me. Of course, they didn't know what was coming, but they would see his body broken before their eyes the next day. And so this morning, Lord, as we receive this bread, it's with a full understanding of the price that you paid to bring liberation, to bring hope, and to bring transformation. Lord, we pray that we would not presume upon your grace, but that we would participate with your grace in pursuing holiness and being conformed into the image of Christ. We receive this with grateful hearts. Amen. In the same way, after the meal was over, Jesus took the cup, and after having blessed it, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, shed for the remission of sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. The next day they would see his blood poured out. They would see poured out as thorns were placed upon his head. They would see it poured out as his side was speared. They would see life flowing from him that life could be ours. And so this morning, Lord, as we receive this cup, we are grateful that we find our life in you. And we ask that you would direct our steps and that we would follow you. We pray it in your name. If you'll stand, we're going to sing together the last verse of When I Survey. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. And then I'll dismiss us with a benediction. So let's sing. May God the Father, who has by his Son broken the power of canceled sin and set the prisoners free, whose blood can make the foulest clean, may he abide with you as you go from this place in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. You're dismissed.